Back to a dark time when science and magic were one. When a shadowy brotherhood embarked on an esoteric quest for gold, divine wisdom, and the secrets of immortality. Since the dawn of humanity, it has fascinated us. Many have loved gold for what it can buy. Others have worshipped it as a symbol of what we yearn to be. Gold is the perfect metal. You can take a gold ring, you can leave it in seawater, it will not corrode. Silver will, iron will, even lead will degrade over time. The pharaohs of Egypt were the first to mine gold some 5,000 years ago. Perhaps it is not surprising that in this land of gods and gold, the quest for riches and the search for divine wisdom were destined to become one. In the strange, secretive work, which strove to turn lesser metals into gold and sought to perfect the human soul. The ancient craft of alchemy. Alchemy was invented in the first couple of centuries AD uh, in Alexandria, which is in Egypt. And the Egyptians were known for having very complicated spiritual and technological practices right alongside each other. Alchemy's origins are so mysterious that no one knows exactly what the word alchemy means. Some scholars trace it to the Egyptian word chem, the rich, life-sustaining mud of the Nile. Others believe it derives from the Greek word kima, meaning to pour or cast. From the beginning, alchemists deliberately hid their secrets from the world. Alchemy was not meant for the common person to grasp. It was seen to be only the people who were favored by God, the initiates who knew the language, who could read the symbols, who were really pure people themselves, who could reach this wonderful knowledge. The most famous of the Egyptian alchemists was Zosimos of Panopolis, who lived in Alexandria sometime in the third century AD. He was the first to describe the elusive, all-powerful talisman any alchemist had to possess in order to succeed, a mineralogical riddle known as the Philosopher's Stone. There is a stone which is not a stone, a precious thing which has not value, a thing of many shapes which has no shape. This unknown thing which is known to all, Zosimos of Panopolis. The Philosopher's Stone was usually pictured as a very dense, glassy, red or yellow substance, and it was thought that an incredibly minute portion of this substance could transmute a substantial quantity of mercury or lead into gold. But the Philosopher's Stone was more than the key to stupendous wealth. The alchemists believed that he who possessed the stone held in his hands the godlike power to grant eternal life. The Philosopher's Stone was the touchstone of perfection. Anything that touched it would be transmuted to perfection. If you touched a person with the Philosopher's Touchstone, you would be transmuting them into the perfect state. Freedom from all of the ills of age, disease, 
every infirmity and, of course, death. In their dark, hot, smoky workshops, alchemists labored hard to create the Philosopher's Stone by following ancient mystical formulas, mixing, melting, and dissolving minerals in a strange process they called transmutation, part metallurgy, part mythology. Transmutation is based on the theory that metals are made out of sulfur and mercury. It was also thought that the precious metals were primarily made out of mercury. For example, gold was believed to be almost pure mercury with a little bit of sulfur thrown in to make it yellow. So it was only logical then to try to make the transmutative agent, the philosopher's stone, out of mercury. But the uninitiated found little logic in alchemy's bizarre world. Alchemical books hid the secrets of transmutation among indecipherable pages of violent, erotic, or monstrous images. Even scholars who have made a career of studying alchemy are often baffled by its fantastic code of symbols. One of the recurrent images that is most striking in medieval and early modern alchemy is the image of a man and a woman bonded together, a hermaphrodite. I would like to know precisely what the alchemists had in mind when they used this bizarre and grotesque image. On the one hand, it seems to symbolize the union of the volatile and the fixed, the non-volatile. On the other hand, the union of the soul and the body. On the other hand, good and evil. To have an alchemist and to be able to press him on the meaning of this hermaphroditic symbol would indeed be a thing worth doing. Beneath alchemy's layers of arcane imagery lay a supremely ambitious goal. Alchemists aimed at nothing less than revealing the ultimate mystery of creation. Alchemy was about a search for the secret of life. People believed that metals, plants, animals all grew. They all shared the property of life. So that when an alchemist worked in his laboratory and tried to imitate nature, tried to imitate the growing of gold in the earth, the maturing to gold in the earth, he believed he was looking for the secret of life. Alchemy's secrets survived through centuries of chaos as Rome fell and classical civilization declined. Muhammad's Muslim armies conquered Egypt in 643 AD. While Europe languished in its dark ages, it was Arab alchemists who nurtured and refined the ancient craft. By the 11th century, Europe's finest minds were learning alchemy from their peers in the Islamic world. Despite opposition from the Catholic Church, the secret art would flourish in the Middle Ages. The Gothic Cathedral, a prayer in stone. Built in the 12th and 13th centuries, these soaring, graceful churches were the crowning glory of medieval Christendom. But some believe that their dazzling facades also display ancient mystical symbols, alchemical icons the Vatican had condemned. Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Carved beneath its magnificent sculptures of Christ and the saints are some oddly unchristian figures. A woman displays a lizard seemingly engulfed in flame. 
A soldier battles valiantly against unseen enemies. An unknown figure examines a mysterious flask. As Christian symbols, they are meaningless, but they appear frequently in alchemy. Well, alchemical symbols were definitely built into Notre Dame and into most of the cathedrals. If you look into the niches in Notre Dame, you will find a woman with a shield, and on that shield is a salamander surrounded by fire. And salamanders, being water creatures actually, will secrete a milky liquid which keeps them from burning for a little bit and there's a chance for the salamander to survive long enough even if it's been thrown in a roasting fire. So of course this came the medieval belief that the salamander was a creature of fire and was immune to it. The meaning of Notre Dame's mysterious images remains controversial. But it is a fact that during the Middle Ages, alchemists carried on their ancient secret quest, sometimes within the very bosom of the Catholic Church. Uh, an archaeological dig that has been done in the Louvre, in the Garden of the Louvre in Paris, actually has found alchemical apparatus in a latrine that was found at the site of a former monastery. And chemists found that, yes, indeed, these were alchemical substances that these monks were uh, working with. One of the medieval world's greatest alchemists was a 13th century English friar named Roger Bacon, widely regarded as the most brilliant scientist of his time. Despite years of experimenting, Bacon never succeeded in making gold. But he did invent something that would have a profound effect on history. Gunpowder. As Bacon's fame spread, so did dark rumors about what went on in his laboratory. It was whispered that he could summon the devil, that he had made a talking brass head and a mirror that could predict the future. Talk like this was too much for Bacon's ecclesiastical superiors. In 1284, the Pope jailed the brilliant monk on charges of heresy. Medieval Europe's greatest alchemist spent the rest of his life in prison. Others suffered even grimmer fates. People believed that sulfur was associated with the devil. So if they came into your laboratory and it was stinking of brimstone, which is the medieval name of, for sulfur, obviously you'd just been conjuring the devil. So, of course, the medieval alchemists were very often burned as witches. In 1317, 33 years after Roger Bacon's arrest, Pope John XXII decided that once and for all, alchemists had to be stopped. Alchemies are here prohibited, and those who practice them are punished. They must forfeit to the public treasury for the benefit of the poor as much genuine gold as they have manufactured. If they have not sufficient means for this, they shall be considered criminals. Pope John XXII. Despite the papal ban, many alchemists persevered at grave peril to their lives, both from their human persecutors and the dangerous substances they handled every day. You have to remember that most of the alchemists were playing around with mercury and with sulfur. The compounds that you can chemically make from these include mercury fulminate, which is the main chemical ingredient in blasting caps, and all of the different compounds of sulfur, which are used for gunpowder. So 
If you made mercury fulminate and dropped it at the wrong time, you would blow up your kiln, yourself, and the entire laboratory. This happened with great frequency in the Middle Ages, and some people were maimed, and many people were just never seen from again. But even as some died in explosions and the church lowered its iron fist on others, one medieval alchemist may have achieved the centuries-old dream of his secret craft, the Philosopher's Stone. In the middle of the 14th century, Nicolas Flamel was a humble scrivener living in Paris, earning a modest living copying manuscripts. He also spent decades struggling to fathom the secret symbols of alchemy. Flamel claimed that on January the 17th, 1382, he succeeded at last in turning mercury into pure gold. Although this story seems fantastic, the municipal records of medieval Paris reveal an astonishing fact. Before they died in the early 15th century, Nicolas Flamel and his wife endowed 14 hospitals, three chapels, and seven churches. How could a modest scrivener afford to give a fortune to charity? To this day, speculation surrounds this question. Even Flamel's death is wrapped in legend. For centuries, it was rumored that the Philosopher's Stone had granted him another alchemist's dream, eternal life. He and his wife disappeared, and there were occasionally sightings of them for years afterwards around France and in other countries. People say, you know, I think I'm certain I saw Flamel and his wife, and that they had this strange golden tone to their skin, and they didn't look any older, even though it was 10 or 20 years had passed. As late as 1818, some 400 years later, a man claiming to be Nicolas Flamel appeared in Paris coffee houses, offering to reveal the secrets of the Philosopher's Stone. The legend of Nicolas Flamel may be only a wishful fantasy, meant to encourage all those who labored in vain for the ever-elusive Philosopher's Stone. But as the alchemist secretly toiled, risking the Vatican's wrath, times were changing in their favor. By the beginning of the 16th century, a new era had swept away the old medieval world. After centuries of humbling themselves before religion, Europeans reveled in the liberation of the Renaissance. No longer was man confined to playing a role in God's creation. Now man stood at the center of the universe, free to use the power of his mind to explore and conquer nature. It was time for alchemy to emerge from its medieval shadows into the dazzling sunlight of a bold new age. The Renaissance was really the golden age of alchemy because so much alchemy was practiced at the time. Princes all over Europe were employing alchemists at their courts. Courts were very much invested in spectacle and theater of all kinds, and alchemy was another part of that spectacle. If you were a rich noble, you needed to have a court alchemist. It's the same thing as having an astrologer, having your giant, having your fool, having your dwarf, having all of the other things. It had to be done to keep up appearances. In the 1580s, the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, one of Europe's most powerful monarchs, had more than 200 alchemists working for him near his palace in Prague, 
in an alley dubbed Golden Lane. For alchemists, aristocratic patronage brought an end to financial worries and the beginning of new anxieties. The alchemist was in a really tight spot because he had to both advertise his abilities but not give away any secrets. He had to prove he was successful by transmuting silver, lead, whatever into gold. And sometimes if he didn't produce quick enough, he could be in trouble. History tells gruesome tales of greedy princes brutally torturing alchemists, trying to force them to reveal the secrets of their art. More than one alchemist fled for his life when the gold he promised failed to materialize. Yet despite its risks, the lure of living on a noble's expense account made alchemy a popular Renaissance profession and a favorite Renaissance fraud. If one looks at the legal records, it seems that, in most instances, alchemists were tortured and executed because they had been exposed as charlatans. And this is a very common incident, in fact. An alchemist is exposed for producing counterfeit gold in lieu of real gold. The ruler, of course, takes umbrage, and then the alchemist is executed, usually by being hanged, dressed in gold tinsel, sometimes from a golden gallows fitting symbolic death for an alchemist. And yet strange reports exist of actual transmutations. Today we are astonished by these mysterious claims. How could 16th century alchemists achieve the seemingly impossible task of transmutation? The answer may lie in that famous ancient saying, all that glitters is not gold, at least not pure gold. Alchemists said that gold was a heavy, yellow, malleable metal. It could be beaten out into very thin sheets. It was ductile, that is, you could pull wire out of it. And it was very difficult, if even possible, to corrode so that any metal that could be made to satisfy those conditions would, by definition, be gold. And it seems that they were able, in some cases, to produce alloys that did satisfy those conditions. Dominating this riotous Renaissance world of greed, mysticism, and chicanery, was the enigmatic figure of one Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, better known as Paracelsus. He was one of history's more difficult men. His middle name, Bombastus, passed into English as the word bombastic, meaning excessively pretentious. But pompous as he was, Paracelsus had much to boast about. For it was he who gave alchemy a new and noble purpose. While other alchemists of his day struggled to make gold for princes, Paracelsus used the secret art to heal human suffering. Paracelsus is one of the more flamboyant figures in the history of medicine widely respected and widely hated. He was known for accomplishing cures of various diseases which had stubbornly been resisted to all kinds of other traditional treatments. A determined foe of medieval superstition Paracelsus proved that miners died of lung disease because they had inhaled mineral dust, not because their digging had offended wrathful mountain spirits. And when Europe was ravaged by a terrible new disease called syphilis, brought home by explorers of the Americas, 
he boldly sought a cure in one of alchemy's most dangerous substances. Paracelsus was an advocate of using mercury to treat uh, syphilis. And uh, although we know that uh, mercury, which is uh, raw, is quite toxic to the human body, with chemical treatments, uh, it can be made into forms that are, are not lethal to the human body. Doctors used mercury to treat syphilis until the 20th century. Paracelsus is remembered as one of history's greatest physicians, an epitaph he would have happily written himself. For it was he who first boasted of creating human life. One of the things he claimed to be able to do in his laboratory was to produce artificially in his glass test tube with the aid of his chemical apparatus a miniature human being and he called this the homunculus. Far from concealing how he had made his homunculus, Paracelsus openly published his recipe. An airtight container of human sperm buried 40 days in horse manure then magnetized, then fed 40 days on human blood. The result, according to Paracelsus, a fully functioning human being. It may be raised and educated like any other child until it grows older and is able to look after itself. Paracelsus. News of the homunculus stunned Europe. Paracelsus' outraged enemies accused him of playing God. His fellow alchemists rushed to their laboratories to make their own homunculi. Many claimed to have succeeded, but strangely, no one would display his homunculus, not even Paracelsus. In the end, even Paracelsus's gigantic ego was humbled by fear. He told the world that he had destroyed the living being he had once boasted of creating. He felt it morally objectionable to bring into being a creature which did not have a soul. Why did this creature not have a soul? It was only God who could implant the soul in the individual. Paracelsus died in 1541. Ironically, his innovative brilliance may have sparked alchemy's demise. By the next century, the ancient art was being discredited by the new experimental science Paracelsus had helped inspire. Yet even as Europe entered the Age of Enlightenment, Alchemy's dark secrets never lost their seductive lure. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Isaac Newton, 1666. Sir Isaac Newton, discoverer of the laws of gravity and motion, inventor of calculus and the reflecting telescope. Perhaps the greatest scientific mind in history, only Albert Einstein has been judged his equal. Newton's experiments in physics made him famous in his lifetime. But few knew that Isaac Newton was conducting other secret experiments, work he obsessively concealed until the day he died. Isaac Newton was a devoted alchemist. In 1936, 200 years after Newton's death, Scholars were astonished to discover long hidden notes of the great physicist's alchemical experiments and over a million words he had written on the secret art.
his nephew, Humphrey Newton, witnessed his alchemical experiments. Especially at the spring and fall, he used to employ about six weeks in his laboratory, the fire scarcely going out either night or day. What his aim might be, I was not able to penetrate. But his diligence made me think he aimed at something beyond the reach of human art and industry. Humphrey Newton. He believed in the mechanical philosophy that matter is just made up of particles in motion, but it was far too confining for him. And what he was really looking for in his alchemy was those vital principles in nature, that secret of life in nature, in matter. It was a religious quest for him. Some scholars believe that Newton's alchemy may hold the key to one of the most baffling episodes of his life. At the age of 51, Newton sent bizarre letters to his closest friends, full of strange accusations, complaining of incidents that had never taken place, declaring that he would never speak to them again. He also complained of sleeplessness and other mysterious ailments. Generations of scholars were baffled by this bizarre episode until Newton's obsession with alchemy came to light. Sleeplessness, severe memory loss, and paranoid delusions are among the textbook symptoms of mercury poisoning. It is possible that alchemy rendered one of the world's greatest intellects temporarily insane. Alchemists worked with mercury. Mercury was the central element in alchemical theory. And they were working with mercury all the time. And they tasted things in order to see whether they were sour or sweet. They smelled things. They rubbed it on their skin. So it wouldn't be surprising at all to me if Newton had mercury poisoning. There is evidence in the form of strands of Newton's hair that have been analyzed in recent times where the concentration of mercury is much higher than normal. So it seems to me uh, entirely plausible that Newton may have suffered from mental instability at one point in his life as a result of his alchemical experimentation. Isaac Newton recovered from his mysterious breakdown and lived another 34 years dying in 1727 at the age of 85. In his final years, he confided in his friends that he greatly missed his alchemical work, and that if he were younger, he might, as he put it, give the metals another touch. But by the end of the 18th century, respectable scientists no longer believed that metals lived and grew. Only a few cranks and con artists still practiced alchemy. After centuries of mesmerizing Europe's greatest minds, alchemy seemed destined for history's scrap heap, a discarded relic of an ignorant past. At the dawn of the 20th century, the ancient art of alchemy seemed destined for oblivion. It had long been dismissed as a mere historical curiosity. And then, in the 1920s, Interest in alchemy suddenly revived after one of Europe's most distinguished minds made an astonishing claim. The Swiss psychologist Carl Gustav Jung was a former disciple of Sigmund Freud, who had broken away from his teacher to found his own school of psychotherapy. Jung reported that his patients saw mysterious, fantastic images in their dreams images they claim nothing in their personal lives could explain. For years, Jung puzzled over these dream images, unable to interpret them. 
until he stumbled upon the long neglected works of ancient alchemists. Examining their arcane symbols, Jung was stunned to discover that they were strangely similar to the images in his patient's dreams. He became convinced that alchemy's bizarre images were messages of psychic healing from the depths of the unconscious, appearing to troubled souls in ancient and modern times. The symbolism of alchemy has a great deal to do with the structure of the unconscious. The dreams of modern men and women often contain the very images and metaphors we find in these medieval treatises. Carl Jung. Carl Jung devoted the rest of his life to developing and defending his theories of symbolic meaning in psychotherapy, including the symbols of alchemy. His disciples still carry on his work. The psyche is in darkness, and it needs to be liberated from that darkness, just as the gold is brought out of matter uh, in alchemy. So, uh, in liberating and bringing to your conscious mind what is unconscious, you're performing a kind of alchemical process. Whether you go through the process of psychoanalysis or whether you are puttering around in your lab until you have achieved the Philosopher's Stone, it's the same thing. Once you have achieved yourself, you have become a self-actualized person, you have achieved the Philosopher's Stone, and metaphorically and psychologically, you have achieved transcendence. Jung's psychological interpretation of alchemy remains controversial, but he has not been the only 20th century thinker to investigate its mysteries. At Harvard University in 1941, physicists brought the power of the atomic age to the ancient alchemical work of transmutation. Using the newly invented particle accelerator, they bombarded 400 grams of mercury with high-velocity neutrons and transformed a tiny amount of the mercury into gold. This was the first scientifically documented transmutation in history. The ancient and medieval alchemists, or even the early modern alchemists, did not have anything like the energy at their disposal that one has in a modern nuclear accelerator or cyclotron. And in fact, this does not provide any justification for thinking that the alchemists really were able to perform genuine transmutations of metals, just because modern physicists can do it. On the other hand, it does offer a sort of a latter-day justification of their theory, their belief that elements could be transmuted. The physicists bombarding mercury with radiation until they created gold may have actually done the transmutation the hard way and there may actually be a simpler method of transmutation locked within the alchemist manuscripts and the engravings upon the cathedral. The Harvard experiment that demonstrated a uh, minuscule transmutation of gold uh, is in my way of thinking not a vindication of alchemy even though it's an interesting experiment. What's more important to me is to try to find the underlying energy that the alchemist understood and worked with. I think it's not so important to prove that it's possible to make transmutation. To me, this is a given. Even today, there are those who pursue alchemy's ancient quest, gripped by its seemingly timeless allure. Russell and Sue House are contemporary alchemists. For them, alchemy is not the pursuit of wealth. It is a search for the deepest spiritual truths. 
As a modern alchemist uh, in the 20th century, I'm not interested in making gold. Uh, it's not because I don't believe it could be done. I think my interest in alchemy began when I was a child. Uh, I was very inquisitive, I liked nature, but I was also uh, very much involved in my church and I liked the things I heard there. I thought that if people could see what I had seen through a microscope, that they would see that, there's, that it's, it's evident that there is some kind of God. I have found alchemy to be a way to travel within myself. And so it's not just a process for me of watching um, an experiment taking place, but it's going within me and finding parts of myself that I didn't realize were there and being able to mesh that into my life and use it and grow from it. Perhaps the magic of alchemy lies not so much in its ancient promise of transmuting base metals into gold, but in its mystical qualities that seem to transcend the limitations of modern science. Whatever its attraction, its secrets are only revealed to those who go in search of history.